have been together in community all day, it feels like, but it feels wonderful. And so I'm just so excited about this particular panel that we're getting ready to have, these beautiful black women that have, listen, that have graduated from Harvard Divinity School and continue to amaze those of us who follow behind them. And so I'm just going to go ahead and introduce uh, this panel quickly. The Beyond HDS panel focuses on the beautiful black women who have matric matriculated through Harvard Divinity School. Each of them have cultivated and nourished a community for black students here at HDS that continue to follow them. We honor them in their work that they have also contributed to the Black Religion, Spirituality, and Culture Conference. It would not be here today without Taylor Stewart. And so we have to honor her. And those who also co-authored co and co-planned the original uh, Black Religion, Spirituality Conference, which is also, I believe, Carlene Sekou, who will be uh, speaking later on at the dinner tonight, at the Sekou for dinner. And Am I missing anyone from, no? Okay, thank you. Uh, so we honor those special women. Um, without them, we would not have today. Um, and as we continue, our panelists will give us their experiences for life after HDS and will center how black women who graduate from this space take their learnings to the beyond. It does not have to stay in the academy. Our experiences here cultivate the future for future generations to come. So on our panel, we have Taylor Stewart. Taylor is a second year doctoral student in counseling psychology, psychology at Boston College's Lynch School of Education and Human Development and a graduate of Harvard Divinity School she got her MDiv in 2018. Her research focuses on the mental health of students of color attending predominantly white universities, racial trauma, and spiritual religious coping. While at HDS, her studies focused on spiritual care and counseling, particularly for college students of African descent. Taylor is a race and culture researcher for the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture at Boston College, which was founded by her doctoral advisor, Dr. Janet Helms. Post HDS, Taylor continued working in university chaplaincy at Wellesley College for an additional year. She now works as a therapist for college students. This academic year, she is receiving her training at Massachusetts College of Arts, Design, uh, Design Counseling, and Wellness Center. In the upcoming academic year, she will receive training at Wellesley College Stone Center Counseling Services. So Dada Jackson is a student of practice who lives in her body and vacations in her mind. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Theater with a minor in English and a Master in Education and Secondary Education, both from UMass Boston, and an MTS in Indigenous Traditions from Harvard University's Divinity School. She is a certified 200-hour yoga teacher and a teacher trainer for Akasha Yoga. I want to make sure I say that correctly, studio and Four Corners Yoga and Wellness Yoga Teacher Certification Program. Presently, she works as an independent consultant. She works with leaders, educators, and trainers in the field of education, training, wellness, and healing. A facilitator, coach, and speaker, she supports the groups and individuals in embodying and curating ethical relationships and practices and sustainable structures in their work. Her goal in doing this work is to end relational and structural violence violence done on marginalized bodies. She is Natick Nimma. Nim Nim Thank you. We also have Chandra Plowden. Chandra Plowden is a womanist thinker, religious scholar, preacher, and barbecue enthusiast. <laughs> Born and raised in Manning, South Carolina, Chandra is a first-year doctoral student at Harvard University's Committee on the Study of Religion. Her research interests focus on black Southern women, storytelling, black Atlantic religions, and Afro-Protestant religious histories. Chandra is a 2018 graduate of Harvard Divinity School's Master of Divinity program. While at Harvard, she was named a Harvard Ministry Fellow, the highest fellowship any MDiv student may receive during her academic tenure. Additionally, Chandra was awarded the 2017 Bill Preaching Prox, an annual Harvard competition and tradition for MDiv students. Chandra was licensed as a Baptist minister at the Alfredship Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia in 2015. 
and has shared the pulpit with well-known preachers, scholars, and social justice activists. Before attending Harvard, Chandra served in nonprofit and corporate research sectors in Washington, D.C. area. She also holds a Master of Public Policy from the University of Minnesota and a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Political Science from Columbia College in Columbia, South Carolina. She is a member of the Boston Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta and Sorority Incorporated. Thank you. And now we also have this panel moderated by the one, the only, Dr. Gloria White Hammond. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, Dr. White Hammond's ministry of healing spans four decades and two continents. She served as a dedicated pediatrician at the South End Community Health Center from 1981 to 2008, where she provided care for resilient families from some of Boston's most challenged communities. In order to provide additional support for her most vulnerable adolescent female patients, Dr. White Hammond founded Do the Right Thing, W-R-I-T-E, in 1994. The ministry subsequently served over 200 high-risk girls through small groups in Boston public schools, juvenile detention facilities, and on-site at Bethel AME Church. Dr. White Hammond was appointed Swartz Resident Practitioner in Ministry Studies in 2015, where she develops learning opportunities for students to explore the intersection of medicine and spirituality. She also co-directs the Harvard Medical School and HDS course Medicine and Spirituality and Healing, along with Dr. John Petit of Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. White Hammond is a graduate of Boston University a with her AB in 1972, Tufts University School of Medicine with her MD in 1976, and Harvard Divinity School with her MDiv in 1997. She is a member of the Board of Trustees at Tufts University, a member of the President's Advisory Council, and many other things. Let's give them a round of applause. Right. Thank you so much. And let me just start by thanking Nicole and Ashley and Kayla for organizing this event. This is, this is the conference. You could also call it Black Girl Magic. This is it. And what I love is that this is such a diverse audience. And I think it is so important. So often the academy has conferences where the speakers, it's the academy speaking to the academy. Um, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got no swing. And I really appreciate the fact that we have people from the community here and people who are at the, we're all here. So you built it and we came and I thank you very much. And, um, and so we're going to talk today. Um, and I, I'm going to get out of your way. We, have we had a great time today? Yeah. And I want to thank you for staying. See, see, the people who came this morning were the people of little faith. You're the ones who said, I'm going to come and I'm going to stay until I get everything I need out of this experience. So hallelujah. Thank you for your presence. We're going to begin now uh, by having Sadata come and do a presentation. Each, As you know, the format is each of our presenters will give a 10 to 12 minute presentation. Then we'll have a little discussion among us. And then we want to open it up so that there's conversation among us all. So without further ado, please receive Sister Sadata. Amen. So, kwata kwakwa wani wani no kishkwa tuon kunipiam and tabatni. Good afternoon. It's really, really, really good to be here with all of you. Um, welcome and thank you. Um, I know that we've already done a land acknowledgement this morning, but. <clears throat> I really try to be a person of practice, or at least return to my practice. Uh, it tells you a little bit about kind of where I am and who I am, you know? And, and that's kind of a cornerstone of my work, is that my work teaches me and, and that I teach in my work. So I want to acknowledge this land, um, this space, this relationship, um, our mother, uh, to whom I am kin, um, the land of the Massachusetts, I am a part of the sister tribe of theirs, their landed kin as a native Nipmuc. I want to acknowledge the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag. I'm grateful to the people of this land um, and my ancestors who are Nipmuc. I want to extend some gratitude to our ancestors of African descent, whose labors of this land and whose love of their descendants 
to be free, to be happy, to be joyous, made our institutions and infrastructures possible. I want to continue my gratitude to Professor Alupana for providing me space and time to theorize about what I will talk through you today. I also want to thank Professor Giles for providing me the space to practice in this way. And I want to especially thank um, to Todney Thomas, Professor Todney Thomas, who advised me to find spaces where I could write and I could be who I am. So presently, I'm in the process of clarifying my work. And for me, that means aligning my work of what I've done, what I'm doing, what I intend to do to bring stillness and peace to the world, um, to those who I come in contact with, and to myself. As an artist, uh, a dancer, and a, an actor, as a teacher of dance, theater, and yoga, as a teacher developer, a director, a community-based organizer, and an introvert with a big heart that <laughs> that hurts, that loves, that breaks, that hurts, did I tell you that it hurts? <laughs> and that hurts others sometimes. One resource I found most useful is space. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about a practice of space and the sensorium. I will also provide by invitation a practice. Now you don't have to RSVP and you simply need to practice if you choose and if you don't choose, to allow others to do the same, either to choose or not to choose. <laughs> so the method that I'll use for this presentation will be a read aloud, think aloud. Um, this is borrowed from an English language arts um, method of kind of making explicit my thinking, how I'm doing it, kind of model. Um, hopefully um, give you space to reflect, uh, to hopefully be inspired and, you know, Maybe we'll have some fun, you know. I got a homework assignment for my sister prophet friend, Lama Rod, and he said, have fun. <laughs> and I think because he knows that I'm often very serious, and sometimes it's because I'm very scared. So the theories. Uh, the one on the left, the sensorium, it says sensoria, but um, that's, um, I want to talk about sensorium. Um, so that's the theory in which I'll talk about. This is the theory that Catherine Lynn Gertz um, speaks about in her book, Culture and Senses, The Bodily Ways of Knowing in African Communities. This is a book that I used um, as a cornerstone in my independent study with Professor Lupina um, that on an independent study that I called Indig African Indigenous Religions in the Body. Although her work is specific to the anglo Iwe people, I have this experience of bodily way of knowing as a dancer. Uh, as an educator of dance, of theater, and of yoga, and even as a teacher developer and as a program director. Gertz argues, quote, that culture's sensory order or sensorium is one of the first and most basic elements of making ourselves human. She defines sensorium, um, sensory order, as, quote, a pattern of relative importance and differential elaborations of various senses through which children learn to perceive and experience the world in which they develop their abilities. As a person who lives in her body and just vacations in her mind, I found this to be true about me as an adult. And I, and I work to provide this embodied experience for those who I work with so that they can continue to experience the world and develop their abilities. Because aren't we all growing? <laughs> So Gertz's works led me to do some of my own theorizing about this notion of making space. And as an artist, teacher, educator, student of practice, um, and I'm also thinking about how to use this theory in practice to begin what we have been kind of reflecting about today, a praxis. Um, this praxis is what I use to create spaces of learning and healing in my work. Um, and it's something I'm both privately trying to clarify and now publicly working with you to do that too. And so um, I'll talk about now the theorizing piece, which is space. So space oftentimes seems like amorphic, it's like this thing, but I want to do some naming. That space is a physical thing, and face, space can be defined as distance between two objects. Uh, for me, 
that kind of distance can be an insecure place because I, I'm not always feeling a connection either to the other beings or bodies or to what I'm thinking or what's going on in the space. And um, I can better understand what Thich Nhat Hanh then refers to when I can be in this kind of physical space when I ask myself what Thich Nhat Hanh says, what is the nature of this distance? And when I can understand that sometimes, um, something shifts and I start to learn something different. It's new, it's unplanned. I call it the unplanned lesson. There's also emotional space, which is distance between emotional states. Um, that can be difficult to see because emotions are internal, um, at least in their origin. Um, and to, I've been working with this idea of creating emotional distance between states it takes a lot of practice, or at least it does for me. <laughs> and it could be, and I think that when we engage what Goethe says about sensorium and how it's the most basic element of our human cells, there might be some ways in which we can use other materials to create an emotional space. Finally, I want to say that I'm thinking about the relational aspect of space. I talk about physical space between objects, but also the physical space in between my body and other bodies. Um, and that it's also, as much as it's about distance, as it is about embodiment. And as an educator, I'm always learning from these relationships. Um, the relationships I have with my work, the relationships that I have um, with those who I work with, and then the relationship I have with practice. And speaking about practice, I want to invite you to practice with me. And so I've, um, for those of us who are just, you know, um, would rather have kind of more of a frame than these kind of theories and these kind of lofty ideas, um, what I've done here is I've given you kind of the why and the how. And um, in Buddhist philosophy, which is another deep influence of, the, in, um, influence of my work, it's called the causes and conditions. So why do, why should we have these kind of sensorium spaciousness? Um, that it creates space for learning. Learning that can be new, different, and deeper. Um, it also creates space for healing. When I mean healing, I mean repair, reconciliation, recovering, and I'll add restoring. And then how do we do it? Well, we can do it by providing resources. These can be human resources, material resources, the actual physical space, currency, and so on. Also, that it's based in research, both something that is studied conceptually, but also something that is studied through the practice, by practice being studied. And then finally, it needs to be revised. And by revised, I mean that um, it, you, that I mean taking what you've learned in an experience of space and bringing that back into space. And the constantly doing that again and again is what I call practice. So let's practice. So I, um, I have here a song. And what I invite you to do is just listen to the song and listen to what comes up for you as you listen to the song. You know, you can listen to the words or whatever. I also invite you to do whatever you feel comfortable to get through this practice, whether it means move, but like whatever that means, but just be mindful that people are practicing in different ways, okay? So relax in whatever way that means. Thank you. And maybe you can take a minute and just reflect on these two questions for yourself. Particularly, what did you notice came up in your mind, in your other senses? And because our time is limited, I want to just leave you um, with this, kind of why this is important for me. As a black woman, a black native woman, <coughs> Um, in the context of healing and education, I think this is important so we can be our full selves. So that we can know real unconditional love, not love that is um, imposed on how and who we should be or express ourselves bodily. And I think to be healthy and whole, both for ourselves and for others, that this is a reciprocal practice. For me at this time, this practice is helping me learn 
and grow from my mistakes. It's also helping me to dream, to grow, and repair, and repeat. And it's also helping me know what's possible, you know? It's also helping me dream, I guess. So thank you for your time and your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay, we're good. Okay, sometimes I speak really softly. If the volume changes, just you know, do like this. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, what I have to offer today is um, portions of my methodology, or what I'd like to think of my methodology for my upcoming um, research many, many years down the line after generals. Um, <laughs> Y'all pray my strength that I get through. Um, but. I'm presenting a parts of a paper that I call um, Sacred Storylines, Storytelling as Womanist, Black Feminist Methodology in Religious Studies. I'd like to start with two quotes. One from Katie Cannon. Womanism requires that we stress with urgency the African-American women's movement from life to death. We investigate contestable issues according to the official records, which seldom offer any indication why things have gone wrong, nor why benefactors of oppression strive to maintain certain principles, values, and taboos as the center of social reality. In other words, womanist religious scholars insist that individuals look back at race, sex, and class constructions before it is too late and put forth critical analysis in such a way that the errors of the past will not repeat. I offer one more quote from Linda Thomas, another womanist thinker, another womanist scholar. Admittedly, reconstructing knowledge is like tearing down a formidable edifice that has been built over an extensive number of years. A womanist in her reconstruction of knowledge must not only be a diligent craft person, she must also develop an approach that utilizes the kind of technology that can dismantle the seemingly indestructible original building materials. So in these two, um, two quotes, uh, womanist theologian Katie Cannon offers a clear directive that, one, that the study of womanism is to observe the daily lives of black women for critical analysis and in the womanist analysis to privilege intersections of race, sex, and class, class constructions. Thomas furthers Cannon's char charge by advocating the use of technology that privileges black women's voices and also critiques mainstream thought. <coughs> Indeed, womanist work includes making new paths with apt tools that recover that which has been obscured by Western narratives. This paper promotes the storytelling or the practice of storytelling as a useful technology in black feminist, womanist, ethno-historic analysis of black women's religious lives in the United States. More specifically, my work and my forthcoming work, God willing, um, discusses how storytelling narratives in service to black liberation includes sermons, newspaper clippings, anecdotes, letters, fables, conversations, gossip as methods of understanding black women's lives in America. So in a sense, one could consider storytelling as the original qualitative research method. With public discourse, it helps to inform one's mental framing and reform framing processes. Despite intense efforts to fill the void of critical history analysis in black women's spiritual orientations, much evacuation still not much evacuation, much excavation still remains. As an analytical approach, womanist religious scholars aptly identify with the daily struggles, the daily struggles of black women in literary, in literary and scriptural characters. So for example, um, one of the literary, um, literary womanist figures um, could include Hagar, the Egyptian slave in the Judeo-Christian narrative. Um, and also many of the women protagonists uh, within Toni Morrison's Beloved. So through literary figures, womanist religious scholars can help articulate um, a didactic and twofold purpose. One, to offer a reevaluation of dominant Western thought and ethics 
and two, to reconstruct events that the lie that have been obscured. So storytelling is really described as, um, in my paper, as something that pushes womanist and black feminist literary analysis by continuously framing real life black women's experiences as identifiable with the daily struggles of other black women. This method or my proposed method complements the task of womanist theologians to, and I quote, retrieve sources from the past, sort and evaluate materials, and thereby construct new epistemologies that affect change in the space and time occupied by black women. Further, storytelling assists in ethnographic and non-ethnographic methodologies in religious studies by interrogating um, the spiritual dispositions and phenomena that have occurred in black women's lives. Womanist methodology, in order to, and I quote, discover fragments to create a narrative for the present and future, end quote, actively engages with living black women. But how can a womanist religious scholar engage with the life experiences of the now deceased? Because storytelling appeals to both ethnographic and historic methods, stories do have the ability to resurface posthumous voices <coughs> and enter into communities of black women utilizing their life experiences as the primary sources for the development of questions which establish a knowledge base from everyday people. Let me exit out of this. Away. There we go. So further, critical analyses of African American women's religious agency allows scholars to, um, a lens rather, to explore an ideology and theology of liberation through subordination sometimes, or liberation via forms of blendedness. Feminist theorist Louis McKay defines agency as the capacity for autonomous action in the face of overwhelming cultural sanctions and structural inequalities. This definition, however, does not aid in the articulation of circumscribed modes of agency that rely on communal or patriarchal institutions. Even with robust efforts, there is still a lack of critical analysis of black women and their spirituality practices. Even 20 years after Weisenfeld and Newton's pivotal work on African-American religious women's biographies, the religious lives of African-American women still loom as a substantial yet largely undiscovered terrain in the study of religion in America. Because of womanism's focus primarily and context on agency, perhaps agency can fall under circumscribed modes of other forms of agency. Womanist agency, as defined by Walker, Alice Walker, is courageous, audacious, and willful. Monica Col Coleman complements Walker's adjectives by defining agency as acts of creative transformation that aid in survival. By linking agency with an African-American truism, making a way out of no way, perhaps we can come up with other womanist methodologies. So in my research um, and in my lifespan as a scholar, um, I'm looking to advocate for storytelling as a useful practice in the method of forwarding analyses on religious black American women in the United States. Womanist black feminist theology is both constructive and reconstructor. Moreover, if it forwards the voices of black women in their daily lives and socio-religious spheres, especially, and remembers the daily interactions and legacies of the deceased, then it is a useful project. Because black women, black womanist, black feminist thought is centered in the African-American woman's reality and story, Storytelling opens itself up to the possibility of being a useful praxis in gathering new and hidden histories. Therefore, privileging black women helps to debunk and clarify dominant monovocal accounts, constrictions, constructions, reconstructions of knowledge. Serves as a heuristic in following directives put forward 
by previous womanists and black feminists. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm so excited to be here. It's wonderful to be invited to be on a panel, especially after the work that we um, did while here to try to get this conference started. Um, <laughs> today I'm going to really talk about um, what it's been like for me and my studies here at HDS and how I've applied that to the work that I'm doing and the work that I hope to do. Um, so a little bit about myself, uh, as was read in the biography, I got my MDiv from here, graduated in 2018, um, and I studied spiritual care and counseling while I was here. And currently, I'm doing my PhD in counseling psychology at Boston College Lynch School of Education and Human Development. And something that I would love for you all to think about throughout my brief presentation is kind of the role that your own religion and spirituality may have played in your own understandings of mental health, um, be that in a positive way, a negative way. Um, so that's something that I would love uh, for people to hold and think about. And today I'm going to really talk about how I've used my education that I attained here to further my own understandings and hopefully the field's understanding of connections between spirituality and mental health. And my population of studies, black college students particularly, um, or college students particularly, but my research focuses on students of African descent. So while, HD, while at HDS, I, um, I studied spiritual care and counseling through a non-tradition specific lens. And that was because I knew that I wanted to become a therapist. Mm -hmm. And what was important for me was to try to understand how to better uh, reach clients in a way that touch the essence of who they are and in a way that also acknowledge their spirituality and religion, which is something that traditional psychotherapy doesn't necessarily reach upon as much, but there's more of a push towards that now, which is wonderful. Um, so I was introduced to the power of spiritual counseling when I was doing, um, when I was working at an AIDS nonprofit and I was in, at one of the support groups and it was an AIDS nonprofit that was um, for black people, and it was a men's support group, and the therapists in that group began talking about issues of religion and spirituality, and you saw these tough men begin to cry, break down, talk about how powerful a role it had, be that in a positive way or a negative way, and you could really see the transformative power of bringing this into the counseling arena. And so that's what inspired me to actually come to Divinity School. And while I was here, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Cheryl Giles, who was mentioned earlier, and she's a clinical psychologist who's a lecturer um, at the Divinity School as well. And so being able to work beneath her was very, very, um, very, very important for me in my own formation of what I hoped to do. So while I was here for my field education, I did chaplaincy. Um, at Mass General Hospital, so I provided spiritual care for cancer patients there. Um, and I was able to really incorporate things that I was learning uh, in class into practice. How do you meet a client where they are, um, a patient where they are, regard regardless of their spiritual or religious background? So I had clients uh, at Mass General who were all in a particular infusion unit. And this infusion unit was for patients who their their, I hate to say like their last hope was a clinical trial. And so these were the patients that I had the privilege of working with. And I had patients who identified as Catholic, who identified as Muslim, who identified as atheist, agnostic, Wiccan. I had a, a huge um, variety of religious and spiritual beliefs uh, that I got to work with, which was extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, and then in my final year of Divinity School, I started working as a chaplain for students of African descent at Wellesley College. And that was such a blessing because they asked me, they said, Taylor, we know what you study. We'd love for you to come back and kind of be there for our students. Uh, and so I got to really sit with them as they were navigating what it means to not only be a student, but what it means to be a black student on a predominantly white campus and the kind of pain that can come with that and the role that religion and spirituality can play in our lives. Um, so it was very amazing to be working with those students and I worked with them for two years. Um, I worked with them after I left here as well, but I stopped working with them this year just because of other things. 
Uh, and so my thesis work really focused on a liberation-focused spiritual counseling for college students of African descent attending predominantly white institutions of higher learning. And this was particularly targeted towards spiritual care that's being done across racial and cultural boundaries. So I think that especially for our black students who are attending these predominantly white colleges and universities, a lot of times you don't see a lot of people who look like you within administration, within chaplaincy departments. And so how can we help the chaplains <coughs> do better at reaching these students? Um, so that was really what that paper focused on. And in that paper, I really talked about ways for chaplains to place students at the center, explore their own worldviews, um, gearing the spiritual care, not just towards liberation, while acknowledging the context. So not just not just um, not acknowledging the, the difficulty, the pain, the political atmosphere, the police brutality, um, the injustices, systemic oppression, making sure that that's a part of the space and thinking about ways that we can use our spirituality and our faith um, to kind of envision a better future and work towards that and kind of sustain. So that was at HDS. Beyond HDS, I went on to do my PhD, which I'm still doing. Uh, <laughs> and um, my research has dived more deeply into spirituality and religion amongst students and mental health. And so currently, I am working on a study that focuses on spiritual and religious coping um, and the role that it can play in black students' lives, particularly in response to perceived racism on campus and relating that to their overall psychological well-being. And so within psychology, religion and spirituality are considered to be a protective factor. So it's, it can serve as some kind of buffer against the development of some kind of psychopathology or mental illness. Uh, and one thing about black people in this country is that religion and spirituality have been an integral part of our communities. And surveys, na nationwide surveys, it shows that African people of African descent are the most religious identifying and spiritual identifying people of all racial um, and ethnic groups within America, um, as well as within college students, black students are identified as the most um, religious and spiritual. They tend to attend any kind of um, religious space more than their white counterparts, followed by Asian American um, and then Latinx students. And um, also, they tend to draw upon their religious and spirituality for sources of strength in order to cope with things that they are going through. So that's what my study is focusing on right now. Um, I put some seminars, discussion, and workshops. I've had an amazing opportunity to kind of um, speak with uh, mental health clinicians through a workshop talking about ways that we can better incorporate spirituality and religion into the work that we're doing with students, particularly if it's coming up as something that's um, contributing to their presenting concern when they're coming into therapy. And, I, and something that I think is really important to think about in this work is that oftentimes within psycho, psychology and psychotherapy, religion and spiritual belief are pathologized. And so they are looked at as something that is either dismissed or seen as not as important um, or pivotal within someone's mental health functioning. And the data shows us that that just is not the case. It actually is playing a significant role. And so some of the things that I... Um, have, am learning about myself and also speaking with other clinicians about is how can we better incorporate um, spirituality and religion into our conceptualization of our clients. And so part of that is including religion and, religious and spiritual identity on the intake uh, when you're working with clients. So often when you go into a mental health counseling session, you have this huge intake. They ask you about all these things, but they don't ask you about your religion and spirituality. Yeah. And so that's something that the current mental health counseling center I'm working with has incorporated into um, their intake this year after our discussions, which is pretty amazing because um, it comes up a lot within our sessions, but uh, clinicians may not know exactly how to address those needs. Some things that um, are important when working with, with clients, and even within your own community, um, is thinking about, or yourselves, thinking about how your own religious or spiritual values and beliefs may be contributing to what you may be experiencing currently, mental health-wise, well-being-wise. Um, and also, if you do access mental health care, how a clinician can better incorporate your own understanding of yourself, um, of the spiritual, of the religious into your treatment, if that's something that's very important for you. 
And then also another thing that I think about a lot in my work that I'm doing with my clients now and in the work that I hope to continue to do is broadening understandings of what spirituality is. And so um, what that can look like is a lot of times, sometimes think spirituality and religion is just one box. But spiritual nourishment can come in so many different fashions. And so that can be through, as you showed, that beautiful music that you played. And um, it can be through music. It can be through community. There's many different ways that people find spiritual nourishment. It's important to think about that and not just clump religion and spirituality into a box. And also being aware, for me, um, I do view the therapy work that I do as a spiritual practice. And so thinking about how I show up within session, my own location, religious or spiritually, and how that impacts um, my understanding of work with, with my students and my clients. Uh, so, so yeah, those are, those are some ways that I have incorporated what I've learned here into the practical realm. Um, it informs a lot of my research. It informs a lot of my writings. It informs a lot of the discussions that I enjoy having in ways that I try to incorporate better understandings of how to address religious and religion and spirituality within mental health counseling. And I have a couple of things that I'm writing right now that I hope will be published. We shall see. That really encapsulates some of those points um, that I've tried to touch upon briefly here. I didn't want to read anything because sometimes I feel like that language is very much so academic and jargony. Um, but yeah, so that's really the beyond for me. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for those things that you're thinking of work that you're doing. It's really groundbreaking. And, uh, and even in its um, early stages, it's making a big difference. So I'm going to pose a, um, some questions. Um, there's a, for each of you, I have a different question as we um, kind of reflect. And well, let me inform you of this. As, I, as you've heard, I'm a pediatrician. And, and one of the reasons I, I love pediatrics, um, and I'm so glad there was a child in the house uh, earlier. I, as long as there's a kid in the house, I know we're going to be okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I love to understand how people evolve to become who they are, and the experiences they have, people they encounter that all inform who they become. And so I'm, some of my questions will will be in that context. Um, and so I want to begin um, with a question for you, um, Taylor. Uh, he, uh, um, in the New Testament, in Christian Bible in the New Testament, one of our the, the favorite references is to what we call the cloud of witnesses. And these are the people who are no longer present in the flesh. They've died. But the scripture says that they join that cloud of witnesses who cheer us on as we run um, this race, and, and I also think of them as the angels on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, um, I'm going to put all my questions out first, if you could share with us um, one of the angels that's on your shoulder mm -hmm. that enabled you to get from where you were once upon a time to where you are today. Mm -hmm. And then I have a question for you, Chandra, and this is, you mentioned Toni Morrison, and, and I, I wonder if you could reflect on a comment or that Toni Morrison um, made and as I, as I, we, before I share this comment, I, I do want to have a, a just a little bit of disclaimer. The, the church woman in me has a little bit of disclaimer in terms of the vocabulary, uh, and let me just uh, let me just preface it with this. Um, a, a couple of months ago, at, at the end of service, I was going around to check in with people, how you're doing, whatever, and I I I met up, just met one of our our moms, and I. Um, and I love this mom because she's a mom of two boys, and her first one is very cerebral, and her second one, I, I, I love kids who got spunk, like who don't take no stuff, won't be no stuff. And so that is, that is her second one. If, if she had had Miles first, Miles would have not only been alpha, Miles would have been omega. He, he would have been in. Um, and so I check in with her to see, okay, what's he doing now? So she said to me, so Pastor Hammond had been preaching, and it was, you know, it's all about vision for the new year, and, and you should do this, and you should uh, pray, and you should be in conversation with people, a bunch of shoulds. And, and about the fourth should in, uh, she was telling me about Miles, who has been really um, playing with saying bad words. 
they had to scold him around saying bad words. So about the, fir- the fourth shit in, he turned to her and said, and said to her, did he say shit? <laughs> not enough for other people to hear. No, Pastor Hammond did not say that word. So here's the, the comment that Tony Morrison had. You want to fly, you got to give up the shit that weighs you down. And I wonder what shit has weighed you down that you had to give up. <laughs> and then the third question is one that I've been reflecting on at this stage in my life. And, um, yeah, and thank you for having the AR- AARP on the panel. Um, that this is a, a reflection um, from Soren Kierkegaard, who, who we know is a, a noted theologian and philosopher. And it's a it, the, it, these are not the exact words, but this is essentially the reflection. The reminder that while we live life going forward, we understand life looking backward. And I wonder if you could share with us an experience that when you were there, it, as, as, my, as Ray's mother would have said, this don't make no kind of sense. Mm-hmm. It was an experience that felt like it did not make no kind of sense whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But having lived a couple of minutes longer, mm-hmm. Oh, I get it. Mm-hmm. I understand what that mm-hmm. was about. Mm-hmm. So those are our three questions, and um, and each of you could respond. You may have some responses in your own head too. But um, do you want to start first, Tinder? Sure. Um, so as far as the angels on my shoulders, I would definitely say that my grandfather is an ever-present angel on my shoulder, and he was. Uh, Chandra actually knew him as well, yes. but he was. An amazing, amazing man, and he was um, he was a pastor, he was a preacher, he was a presiding elder in the AME Church. He was actually over um, the Charleston district right before the Emmanuel 9. Um, and he always instilled in me a very, very strong sense of faith and living my life with purpose and the power that living my truth um, and embodying my faith Uh, can have in transforming not only my life, but the lives of others. And so whenever I'm doing the work that I do regarding spirituality, or even if it is opportunities to preach or do Bible studies, um, just revealing some of my own personal identities, uh, like that, I always kind of hear him cheering me on. Uh, So I always think about him there. And I think that another, another angel, and she's She's not deceased, but she is definitely someone I think about often, is uh, my very first supervisor when I was doing chaplaincy work. She was an amazing woman uh, who identified, a white woman who identified as um, a humanist, uh, was not really, she wasn't really into like dictating anyone's life by any particular set of doctrine. And she really pushed me and welcomed me and opened me in exploring my own spirituality and understanding how to meet people where they are regarding their own religious and spiritual journeys. And so those two, I think about them very often uh, in the work that I'm doing. So I definitely say that those are my my angels. Can you call their names for us? Uh, Malachi, Malachi Lee Duncan, and Katrina Scott. Thank you, Malachi. Pull this mic in, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. I see y'all laughing at me, but you know, <laughs> I'm just messing with y'all. Um, so the the shit I had to give up to fly, um, it was a lot. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight two things. Um, I think the most important one was my own sense of of an internal timeline. Um, so if anybody knows anything about um, an inward call, um, an inward presence inside of you. Um, You kind of have an idea of what point B is going to be. You don't know the stuff that you have to go through between point A and point B to get to point B. And when you think you've met point B, it may not be point B. Um, And so with that, um, I came actually from the world of work. I was a research analyst, and I was living real nice. Um, and then I, I got the call, um, which evolved into multiple calls. So what do you do with that? I don't know. Um, and so I was led enough in, in, in faith in the divine and love for the divine to give that up. 
It was the hardest thing I've ever done, and I would do it nine times over. Um, and that leads into the notion of the timeline. Um, so I was at Harvard, second master's, um, kind of trying to figure out what does this call mean? And at first I thought the call was to preach, to just preach. Um, because in my tradition, there is still some type of hype among um, televangelists and very, very prominent preachers that receive media coverage. And I realized that that was some of the shit too that I had to give up too. Um, and that preaching is very important. Um, it is, but that is a tiny, 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 tiny part of ministry. The largest part of ministry is doing your own inward work so you don't mess up somebody else's life. And, and, and that is a hard, <laughs> that is a hard road. That's like that loop-de-loop-de-loop-de-loop -de -loop -de -loop -de -loop, um, in, the, in the path and the timeline. Um, but I, I would say the other thing that I had to give up, and maybe this is turning into three things, um, this notion of story. So I, I'm, one of the reasons why I'm taken by stories is that everybody has one, and, you know, we get to edit what we want to tell people and what we don't want to tell people, you know? Um, and oftentimes, particularly at Harvard, the story looks like I graduated from X, graduated from Y, now I do Z. Um, and we don't talk about the other things, you know? Um, so one of the biggest hiccups in my story was my first year, I was preparing to preach a sermon because all I wanted to do was preach. Um, at 5 a.m. and I get a call from my mother saying, your daddy had a heart attack and it don't look good. Um, and that was a part of my story that caused me to have an aversion to preaching, but also strengthened my preaching. Um, in that despite life, I have a sense of duty to me, if to no one else in this world, um, to try to get to point B. And if point B leads to point C or whatever, Roman numeral or you know, Greek letter, um, then, then that's fine. Um, can I say one more thing? No, okay, okay. Um, okay, this is gonna be one very short thing. Um, I get long winded sometimes with stories. Um, but the thing that I, I want to encourage, um, particularly black women here, is that this is not the space where you're gonna die. Period. This is a space where you're going to live, and you'll go out there, and you're going to keep on living. That's it. Thank you both. Um, yeah, so thinking about something that didn't make sense, when I look back at it now, like, I get it. Uh, well, there's a lot. <laughs> so, but I'm going to pick this one thing which was my first time I applied to HDS and didn't get in. It was 2009-ish, and I say ish, because I'd have to look back at like my resume and see. Um, but at the time, um, I was in my early 30s. And um, I'd been teaching for a while, and I left teaching to do some program directing and really wanted to pursue a master's degree that was at the intersection of it then um, Native American uh, traditions and um, dance. And I had been at Leslie and couldn't fund that. And there was this program here at HDS um, that Diane Moore led, mm. which was uh, religion and education. And I thought, this is it. You know, I can explore some of the things I think are overlapping um, in learning and in spirituality, um, which I think is the healing, is repair, is making us whole, you know. I think that um, those two fields do the same thing. And so, you know, when I didn't get in, I was, uh, I was devastated, but I had another application to try it again. And so I did. Um, and I applied to a second time to my first master's program, which is a residential-based program out of UMass called Boston Teachers Residency Program. And I spent about seven-ish. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be very ish about the time. <laughs> um, because time is so difficult for me when I look back at it. But, um, and that was a real growing experience. And it was mostly growing because I tried something again. Yeah. 
And so when I look back, I was like, you know, what, like, why did I need to do these things separately? You know, why, why couldn't I just do it together? But I realize now that I needed to um, forge a new path, a new path of understanding of where um, indigenous uh, kind of worldviews and cosmologies uh, come into contact with education and learning and developing, and, and I'll say healing. Um, I learned a lot here just by being a student. You know, I just really wanted to immerse myself in, in content and uh, field notes and you know, theoretical frameworks mm -hmm. around indigeneity. Um, and so that's why I'm kind of beginning, you know, beginning to kind of make my container for all the things that up until this for some years, uh, <laughs> I've lived this life and I've worked. Um, and, and I want to offer something, um, you know, hopefully new to help free us all. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. so much. We want to have an opportunity to hear from you, your questions. You know, we can say the benediction and go home. That is okay, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you all for sharing your work, um, just being here. Um, what was something, what was a key moment at HDS that like made you sure that this was the place that you were supposed to be at the time that you were supposed to be here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll start. Um, so I, I came to visit day. Actually, I didn't want to apply to HDS at all. Um, I was voluntold by um, my graduate advisor at the University of Minnesota that I should apply to Harvard. Did not want to. Um, but I did because I knew I needed his recommendation letter. So let me just pay my $75 and get my recommendation letter. Um, and so I got in, I went to visit day. Um, and I felt this, the strangest feeling. It was like a cold sensation all over my body. A very, very cold, a very strong sensation. Um, and I, I felt led to, to go to the CSWR and pray. Um, because the sensation would not, it just wouldn't let up off me. Um, and I heard something say that this is the final push. Um, I didn't really know what that meant. I have some ideas of what that meant. Um, but it was definitely an in-work calling. Um, and that was continuously affirmed, not necessarily through classes, but by the amazing friends um, I've made here. Some of the best friends I've ever had and probably will ever have. Congratulations on all that you've done and all that you continue to do. Thank you. My question is, um, I'm currently in school and we're studying cultural capital and whose culture has capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so having you African American women um, here at Harvard that contrasts of cultures, whose culture has capital and how have you used the culture of Harvard to increase the capital? <laughs> that is such a good question. Um, and I think that the whose culture has capital is so real. And I, and I'm, I believe, for me, I came to Harvard just because it was Pluralist, pluralistic. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different religions and spiritualities represented at this particular institution, and that's why I came because I want to learn how to best serve people. Um, and I think that going to Harvard gave me leverage upon leaving Harvard mm -hmm. to better serve, be in a position to better serve my community. 
Um, I've I've found that it's so interesting. I'm like I, I I'm like I'm a second year doctoral student, and yet you trust what I'm saying when it comes to spiritual counseling. I don't necessarily know if that's because of my education or the name of my institution where I was educated. And I think that that with that comes a large responsibility. Um, and it's something that, particularly as a race and culture researcher, um, something that I think about a lot, uh, specifically in the field of psychology, we constantly think about who are these, who are these um, interventions and theories designed for, who's deciding what's important and what's not important, and how can we, particularly my um, fellow like colleagues who are in my, with my advisor, we think about how can we push against that and how can we broaden the narrative through our own voices as academics, yes, within like the canon because that's what larger dominant and white society values. Um, so how can we be more represented there? And then also how can we use our skills? How can I use my skills for my community? And for me, I think that that's why a lot of the work I do has been targeted towards black people and black women. So like the seminars on spiritual wellness are for black women. The groups that I have, have done around spirituality and mental health have been for black students. And I think that that's my way of using the capital that I got through being here to better serve my community, if that makes sense. I'd like to answer the question too on that idea of um, kind of how you're leveraging um, because for me, you know, one of the reasons why I came here was for the resources. And I think a big resource is human resources and yeah. through way of relationships. Now, I, you know, I don't know that I'm always good at it. And I, it is a place where I learn. And I think it's a place where all of us learn. Yeah. And um, I think that it's really important to see that as a currency, you know, that the building of that relationship, um, the kind of networking of those relationships are a currency, they're really valuable. And I know for me, um, that has been, I think, the biggest thing that I've kind of gotten out of, of being here is the relationships that I have with people um, and what it's taught me, not just about me, but the work that I'm embarking on. So one of the things that um, is actually an implicit motive in my research um, is the push for reparations. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why storytelling is important is because <coughs> some people just do not care about facts. Some of them just don't, particularly given in this administration. Um, and that sometimes stories are what compel people to get up and do right. Um, and so my, my goal is really like, I'm trying to play the long game, if you will, I guess. Um, in trying to, to push through research how black women especially, um, in my proposed site of research, Charleston, South Carolina, a slave, former slave port city, um, has contributed to not only American capital but also American culture. Mm -hmm. And that reparations, while it will never repay um, the labor and the trauma induced, um, that financial, financial and structural reparations is a start. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much again for coming, and, and thank you again, Nicole, and Ashley, and Kayla for making this happen. I'm going to close with um, another. Um, another comment and you referenced Katie Cannon and if you don't know Katie Cannon is and she's just in the class of her own category yes. of her own one of the she and she we lost Katie was it last year or 2018 oh, I think the 2018 I think was when, uh, was when she she passed and again just a, 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 a giant in terms of her um, her person and her practice and uh, and, and so I'm going to close with this comment as in a word of appreciation to you, to each of you, and, and a little bit of, a, of an encouragement and, and an affirmation of what you said, um, Taylor. So um, Dr. Cannon said, an educated person, you share the knowledge and you empower people with your, with your knowledge. And that's what 
what has happened in terms of your experience here that you you have shared um, your knowledge and your wisdom and um, and empowered people on the other hand and Asia referred to this an educated fool has a little learning and they beat people up mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming here for the knowledge you gleaned mm -hmm. for the wisdom that you developed and for making it available to all of us and because of your generosity mm -hmm. we all leave this place mm -hmm. a lot more empowered mm -hmm. so yes. thank you so much Uh, we want to thank uh, Dr. Hammond, Gloria White Hammond, uh, Sadata, Chandra, and Taylor for offering your gifts in this space.